Hey, sports fans, Coach Nick here, and before we get to the interview, I just wanted to reach out and make sure you knew how valuable ratings and reviews on iTunes are to the success of this pod. So if you enjoy these, head over there and let me know. I'd really appreciate it. And thanks for being in the conversation. Can LeVar Ball get Luke Walton fired? Did Rick Carlisle really threaten ESPN? Just how insane are Filipinos for the game of basketball? And the question left is, say it with me, you win. Hey sports fans, Coach Nick here, and welcome to the B-Ball Breakdown Podcast. Today I am pleased to bring on the show Rafe Bartholomew, who uh, was a senior editor at Grantland.com, and also is a writer of books. And the book that I certainly gravitated towards originally was called Pacific Rims. Cannot wait to talk about that. But Rafe, thanks for joining us today. Nick, thanks a lot, man. I'm happy to finally be here. Yeah, awesome. I mean, I, I feel like, um, you know, having read that your book, Pacific Rims, um, and just sort of like seeing you on Twitter, and, and now you're actually probably, you know, about 20 minutes away from where I am right now. <laughs> at some point, our, our paths were going to cross. I'm glad that we can make it happen, at least digitally right now. Yeah, it does seem like, you know, one step on a continuing journey. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, you know, if you if you I guess if you stay in this thing long enough, right? Yeah. There's just it's just like by attrition, there's you know, there's I mean, you were you on Twitter like were you on basketball Twitter like from the beginning? I would not say from the beginning beginning like the 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 hardcore set. Uh, I think I first I got on Twitter in like 2009. Um I think when I what the, my image of like the basketball internet you know sort of blossoming up probably starts like with the free darko blog and and that was going on while that sort of started up while i was living in the philippines when i had internet there you know that was not an an issue um but it was just i wasn't in so deeply involved in you know uh the american world of basketball because i was immersed in the philippine side of it of course we followed the nba over there but it was not the it was just we you know we didn't we weren't in the same conversation they were sort of parallel sure sure and i know interacting with a lot of people in the philippines now at the time zone obviously is an issue too where like i'll all of a sudden wake up to a whole bunch of tweets from them because it's you know the opposite day but um but let, let's before we get to that i wanted to talk a little bit about what you were tweeting about earlier today uh which is about rick carlisle and his response to lavar ball because uh, I, I do think it's interesting and worthy of a discussion even though i feel like people want to throw their hands up when they hear lavar ball now anyway um but what what was your reaction to rick carlisle's reaction to espn reporting on <laughs> lavar ball's uh, you know, uh, issues I guess he has with Luke Walton and, and what Luke Walton's potential issues could be with the Lakers. Right. So, I mean, and I say, I guess, you know, from the get, I am, I think, dispositionally uh, just inclined to to enjoy the cranks of the world. I have a little bit of that in my in me myself. I like I, I just thought, you know, I like that curmudgeonly figure who just sort of says, Forget, you know, this is this is uh, this is BS like you guys are full of it. Um, And so I, I, I didn't mind that side of Carlisle's message. And I actually think that's necessary that so it's even though it's a conversation that the media like sort of a meta conversation that people in sports media have been having among themselves in private and on, you know, Web pages and Twitter and public as well. But when it all stays within the media, when media people are asking each other, is this really newsworthy? Is this is this a joke? Are we just chasing clicks? How much, you know, that right balance. It's still that conversation. I think it's actually, it, it, it can be important and make a difference that someone from the outside, uh, from, you know, from the real field that in basketball we're covering, the NBA, somebody like Rick Carlisle, will, will call out the media and say, look, what you are doing is frivolous. It does not like it should not affect uh, what's happening inside NBA locker rooms. But because you are giving it such a megaphone, it is. And you guys need to check yourselves because it's 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 you know it's bullshit. Um, and that side of it, and the whole idea that you know media. I don't know. I I, I have a I I'm not a super hardcore believer in the you know capital J journalism. That like I'm not that self righteous. But I went to journalism school and I, I, there's a part, there's a little bit of me that is just sort of like, 
you know, I learned news judgment. That's something we are supposed to have in the media. And we're supposed to be able to look at something and say, okay, this is real and this is not important. And, and the, it's not media's fault necessarily. I mean, it's the, the pressures of the market, of audiences, of, of websites that need clicks to, to thrive. So it's not that, I, so people in media obviously look at uh, LeVar Ball and, and sort of the, the, the sideshow element of it and, and understand that it's kind of a crappy situation that they can't avoid. But it just, uh, it's, I don't know, it's, it's nice to sort of see someone stand up and say, no, this is really not good. Stop celebrating it. And maybe we can't, maybe we just are no longer in control of this machine anymore. Uh, you know, I mean, we've seen, we see it across different uh, walks of life. But I don't mind seeing Carlisle step out and, and actually call attention to it and say, you know, at least think twice about this. Uh, the, the, the flip side uh, of that and the, the sort of the part where Carlisle, I think, went left is where he's like, you know, we work together, so you have to do what we tell you to do. That, I think, you know, look, I mean, people, we in the media uh, write about basketball all the time as if we know how it works, when sometimes we don't know quite as well as we think. Same as basketball coaches, you know, they they talk about the media, he'll give media criticism, but he doesn't know how it works as well as people inside may know it. So look, it's not, he wasn't to totally right and the solution is wrong, but I still, I, I sort of, um, I agree that the root cause is a problem. We're sort of, it's like wag the dog 24 seven now, in my opinion. Okay, wow, there's a lot of things to go through on in that answer. Sorry. So <laughs> let's, Let's start with, okay, here's one, one my reaction I thought I had was, and it's, I, I don't want to say I'm self-righteous or like, you know, taking some sort of, you know, I'm a very stable genius track on this, but, <laughs> you know, we've seen him criticize uh, Luke Walton in the past. And, and it's mm -hmm. a very short season so far, but we've, he's already done that and been pretty explicit. And they've, they try to like even limit his access to media during the games when he's in the runway area. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he says it and they report it. And then, you know, about 24 hours later, you know, the Lakers play another game and they're talking about that and then it goes away. Well, by Rick Carlisle doing this, he's now extended this focus on what LeVar Ball said for at least, I would say, well, at least 24 hours, probably 48 hours. Isn't that part of Isn't that a part of the issue? I guess, yeah, of course, because that you see the way that Carlisle's comments are being covered. And of course, once one coach speaks out, then you go out and ask, you know, every other coach the same question. And Steve Kerr's already given some interesting comments, uh, which I think are the same sort of mix of right and wrong, you know. Um, and I imagine, you know, whenever, you know, whenever the Spurs next media uh, availability is, we'll be we'll be asking, you know, Greg Popovich what he thinks and and hopefully other coaches in the in the league, too, because as as much as I love Kerr and Popovich and think that they have been great voices, you know, throughout their careers, especially in the past year. I wouldn't mind hearing what other coaches have to say about the world as well. Um, but that, that's another thing where we are. I mean, it is really all driven by who gets the most attention. If you get a, if you if you screenshot a quote from Steve Kerr about anything happening in the world, you're getting 500 retweets on that. If you do it with Earl Watson when he was coaching, you're getting 10 or something. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, it, that it, again, it, it's all the the people. That's the thing that I that's sort of my pet peeve here is that it doesn't seem like we're actually we're, we're in the media. We're using our independent judgment anymore to say that, OK, LeVar Ball is or isn't something we should be paying attention to. Or this coach is or is not saying something uh, important that that should be published. It's basically like, well, I know this is going to get attention and I need that attention. So I'm going to publish it. Uh, I don't have the answer to it. I, the answer is bigger than all of us. Uh, but. It, it's frustrating, and I and I, I do um, I sympathize with the coaches' frustrations because the coaches are different. In, in the NBA, you it, it is much more of a hard. You either are good or bad, win or not. Like there's no subjectivity, right? You won or you lost, um, and and they are judged on that. Whereas in media, you can do work that isn't excellent that that performs great. Uh, online uh, or you can you know it's just it, there's a lot of more gray area there uh, so uh, the th the sort of the we can sort of in the media survive uh, those gray areas coaches and basketball players don't get to do that because it, when, when it starts to get into like say in the Lakers case 
starts to affect their locker room, their season, uh, then that is going to hurt Luke Walton's career, possibly cause him, you know, put his job in jeopardy as this season goes forward. Uh, and, and whatever, you know, just playing on what is looking like a crappy, you know, crappier than even we expected Lakers team is not good, great for any of those guys' careers either. I think it goes away uh, if and when the NBA world decides that Lonzo isn't what we thought he might be, you know, and I think obviously you can't make that decision for years, but um, that's when, that's when all this goes away is when people stop caring about Lonzo ball, the player. So, okay. Uh, now again, a lot of things I got to go through in that too, because that's great. Uh, a lot of information there. Well, here's the thing. I mean, in, in my twisted way, I, I will say I kind of run a media company as well. Like I'm sort of on the same, I, I'm not like a competitor of ESPN, but we're in the same space. And there are, you know, times when that I can get a, I, some sort of a perspective on what their business is like. So, and, and first of all, I'll make it clear right now that like dot com revenue is just the worst. It's like banner ad revenue, whatever you want to call that stuff is a dinosaur. It's dying. So I get it. I understand why they feel absolutely compelled to figure out whatever they can do by any means necessary to get those clicks. I would imagine having worked for Grantland that you probably know that all too well um, because of that structure. And it sounded like, you know, if you were talking about simply revenue from what they were generating on the website, I don't know if you can sustain that. They, you know, I, and I come from the video side, which I'm much more comfortable with as far as revenue. Video revenue is a lot better than the dot .com. So anyway, so I understand why, the, why ESPN would feel the, the, the need to do that um, to keep them you know, solvent to some degree. Uh, but don't you think that every coach in their contract in the in the fine print has some sort of a uh, disclaimer or something that says you must endure any criticism criticism from anybody and anywhere at any time that simply is part of your job um i mean i'm sure yeah that's something like that i doubt it is worded exactly like you have to endure <laughs> criticism like i mean uh, and that's that's understood i think that what it is they they're what they're required to you know a show up at media availabilities answer questions be professional like don't freeze people out because they don't like them. And and that's what, look, if Carlisle is really pissed, if the NBA coaches are really pissed, then, you know, I think instead of calling for these kind of crazy out there solutions that that really are causing a bigger controversy than, than what I think Carlisle meant his comments to cause, you know, I mean, I think his message was about news judgment and instead his message is being accepted as, or, or being um, interpreted as, media should do whatever coaches tell them. So he, he kind of, that he kind of stepped on his own feet, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and a real, a better solution, I think for if the NBA coaches, if they're pissed off and want to make a, uh, a statement, come up with some way to, you know, to thwart the media within the rules, like show up, uh, and give everyone, give the same non-answer to one question, you know, get, basically do a, uh, you know, do a, do a beast mode on people or do a Rashid on people and just be like both, <laughs> both, both, both sides played hard, you know, yeah. give the same bad answer and not don't, don't, you know, you, so you're going by the rules, but you're also not giving the media anything they want or can really work with. And then, you know, that kind of, you know, again, I don't know if I really want to encourage like passive aggressive uh, score <laughs> settling, but that you know that then then hopefully if anything it leads to back to a, a better equilibrium where both sides I think are, are engaging honestly. I, I agree, and by the way, I mean it's not we can't pretend like it doesn't happen where writers will will get limited access for X amount of time or for whatever if uh, indeed the team doesn't like what they wrote that time or they will get shit from the player or from the coach and the evil eye and and not get answered questions. So we this has sort of been going on for a long time. Uh, and I agree. I don't think that the solution would be simply like, OK, we don't like what you said. Uh, and that means you are not going to get access. But I have to imagine, and this goes through politics as well, uh, the fear of losing access, which is certainly uh, 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 something that could happen, uh, must shape how they end up covering the team, which I think, I think if, if coming from journalism school, you, you, I wonder your, your impression is, doesn't that fear uh, lessen the product, lessen the quality of the writing and the coverage? Uh yeah, I, I think so. And and this again, this is th these are forces being sh sort of shaping things beyond uh, individual media members control. Um, but I think that there is an effect where 
Yeah, everything on some level is horse trading, and especially at the higher levels of NBA reporting, where there you, know, you you can once you've been around, like if we've been following it for a long time, either as members of the media or just close readers of NBA media, basketball fans, you see, you can almost see the 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 deals being cut between agents and coaches and players and and reporters about how they got access for this or that story uh and when they're allowed to actually attribute their sources and when not and and whose anonymous sources are likely to be important figures in a team and whose anonymous sources are likely to be uh lower level members of the staff who who might who's who, who might not uh, who sound more important as anonymous sources than than, than as name sources? So that it's it's a it's a tricky field, and it's under and it's being changed. It's sort of being pulled more towards the the PR side because you have the growth of sort of independent players tribune type things. Which look, are, they they put out some great stuff. The Quentin Richardson story from this week was fantastic, um, and and it's valuable in that way. But it also sort of puts this extra pressure that drags the traditional media to be more like that kind of media because a, a player or an agent will say, well, look, if you want to write a, you know, half critical, half, you know, praising sort of, you know, more more or more critical take on my player than, than, than this place is, I'm just going to go over there. So then you say, all right, well, let's just not do the critical one because I still need the story. So, and, and again, there's no way to stop it. There's no way, there's not even anything you know, you can point to that's wrong with it, but it distorts what we traditionally think of as, as of how, you know, journalists do their job. Absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll ask you one last question about the subject sure. before we move on, which is, and, and I guess it's either whatever LeVar Ball represents or I guess LeVar Ball specifically, but can LeVar Ball get Walton fired? Um, I don't think LeVar Ball can. I mean, I, and on some level, yes. I mean, it, it, like it's possible. I don't, I, and and I also have been hearing. In fact, friends of mine were started a, a conversation on Twitter over the weekend about. I think Luke Walton should be fired. It had nothing to do really with Levar Ball. They just didn't like the way the Lakers were playing and and think that you know sort of I, Luke should be held responsible. I'm and, and this is actually what I where I wanted to pivot to. You probably should have done it. <laughs> five minutes ago but anyway you know just about the lakers in general i wanted to ask you um you know is is it more i i, I kind of put more blame in general for the whole team situation on the front office strategy and i i and i obviously we're not inside it we don't know what they're thinking um and and it's for me it's like they Based, and this I don't mean recently, but I mean going back to the beginning of the season, they were sort of celebrating this idea that this is a throw an, another throwaway season for the Lakers. They already had the season they threw away, so they could you know so 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 they so they could sell, like Kobe. give Kobe the ball. Like they they this one we're throwing away because we don't want half of the guys on this team, and we're gonna ditch them all, and we're gonna get you know, some combination of Paul George and LeBron James or whichever, whatever super team they can attract over the summer. Uh, who knows if that's still the case after this season, but that was sort of the, the future they were, they couldn't, they couldn't totally put out there for tampering rules, but was clearly the rumor what people expected them to do and what I think the team expected. I mean, you see guys like Jordan Clarkson and Julius Randle who aren't, I think, uh, haven't necessarily proven themselves as, as good NBA starters yet, um, and may never do so, but you can also see that that is really hurting their, I think, development this year and the way they're just, to, or just the team. It just, you know, if if guys know that this team, this this team isn't going to be together next year, and the the front office doesn't want half of you there, and they're either just playing you to to you know to improve your trade value or just not playing you because they don't care about you. Uh, then that is very hard to coach a team like that. It's very hard to, you know, to 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 play as a team together. And you you see that those sort of threads emerging already. And is that Luke Walton's fault? Um, I guess to some extent, if you lose a team, you lose a team. The coach always takes the fall. Um, but this was this this whole journey this season started on a really shaky note. And I think the only way it would have stayed together in a happy way as if they overachieved somehow if somehow everyone started playing great and then they're like hey wait a minute we don't all we don't have to hate each other or whatever you know we don't have we're not competing with each other let's have fun this season and play good basketball that's not happening 
And uh, and I think those little, you know, all that, all those things that went in at the beginning are starting to emerge and 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 showing us that it's not going to work that way. Uh, right. And and here's the thing about that is, uh, you know, and they started out OK. There was a lot of optimism and they were playing better. Um, you know, if you look at the stats, I just kind of surprised myself. I was looking at like the team stats and they have no less than one, two, three, four, five, six, seven guys averaging double figures. Um, in a way that, uh, and, and by the way, they're 15th in defensive rating. So, I mean, if you take a step back and look at what's going on, I, 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 and I've criticized them to no end for the Kobe thing, because I felt like they could have gotten the Kobe farewell tour and developed their players better than they did. Uh, and that just probably goes to even just having Byron Scott as a coach, which was a, a, a troubling thing to the development. But if you look at what happened, the Warriors the Warriors. The Rockets got significantly better. The Spurs, you know, in the beginning were going to be the Spurs, and they, and they basically still are, even with, without Kawhi. So there really wasn't like I don't think that there was any sense of okay what does this season mean in the in the for the Lakers it's not going to be a thing where they're going to get the top four seed anyway um, so I would argue that like you know the building blocks are there they're finally getting a chance to see these guys play and 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 develop like the way they should have done two years ago um, except for the newer newer guys. Uh, so I, I don't have a problem with what Luke's doing um, to some degree. I do feel like there's a lot of lack of attention to detail, especially offensively. Uh, they're probably looking at the fact that they're, they're actually, because they're 15th in defensive rating, you'd think that they'd be better. Um, right. But that to me, that means that they're actually working on defense a little bit. Like That's probably their focus. And offensively, they're like, eh, whatever. We'll let these guys, we'll throw it out there. We'll see. Let's find out if Ingram can isolate and score. You know, And he's been doing that. So... To, to, this is a long-winded answer to uh, to your. I'm not even sure I'm actually answering your question, but um, I, I think that they're, they're doing fine. I think this is exactly what they wanted to do, which is why Luke Walton shouldn't feel like he's threatened at all for this job. And I thought that uh, the, the one thing I said before the season started, I thought, you know what, Lavar Ball, we know what he is, and at the NBA level, I don't think that that kind of thing could really have a big influence. But somebody did bring up that in this specific locker room. With you know a relatively young coach and you know with not a lot, not a ton of experience and um, and then a lot of young players, I was like, oh, you know what? Okay, I could see, I can see how a lot of young guys could be affected by that in this situation. So you, but you, so I, I guess what you're saying is you feel like guys like uh, Randall and Clarkson are are sort of getting caught in the in the tug of war here and are are suffering for it. Not necessarily re- with you know with regards to Levar Ball, although I, I imagine that has some effect just because you can't totally you know cut that out or ignore it. I mean, if we can't ignore it, the people in the middle of the storm probably can't totally ignore it either. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I think that I mean it just seems like the team, from what you you know reading about and hearing the chatter about you know what people are saying about the Lakers, it seems like they've mostly moved on from those guys. You know, they 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 they're they're deciding that you know whatever version of the team moves forward uh and that makes sense those guys are are closer to obviously to getting new contracts and they may not want to spend big money on them it, probably from what they've shown so far that is uh that's that that's justifiable um but it uh it makes for an awkward situation this year when they are you know Randall is coming up on being a restricted free agent right uh, and and he's playing you know at least to increase his value uh, you know Clarkson has the deal where he you know he was a second round pick and 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 he's and both of those guys I think they're looking at the next move or they're looking at just they're they're put they've put I think they've been put in situations and they were players who were already known for being a little bit not you don't want to say selfish but you know guys who look 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 to get their own right right um and uh, i think they've been put in situations where they are almost being forced into doing that even more than they're naturally inclined to because i think the team is sort of messaging to them you're not part of our plans for the future so they're like well i got to do something to secure my future if it's not here I agree. And by the way, there, there, there is legitimate front office criticism that you can label or, or you can uh, accuse of uh, across the board of you, you have to be careful about not having too many players in contract years. And it does take a lot of focus and sort of, you know, way macro thinking to be aware of that. Right. Because you might be like, oh, we got a great deal, whatever. You're like, oh, shit. Like the, we got five guys all about the same year. Like you didn't realize it. Right. Because it's a complicated thing. Uh, I need to check because I, I have a feeling like, I, I, you know, there's got to be more than just Randall and Clarkson. And by the way, that's the key. It looks like on offense, they're all playing for a contract. And that's not a good situation to have. And that's not the, 
it's kind of like not Walton's fault. That almost ends up being when the, when the management has sacked it the, the, a certain way. And who knows if there's a way to control that or not. But I do know, I'm sure good front offices are really aware of that and do try yeah. their best to try and avoid having, you know, that many people. So I will say this, no, independent of a contract year or whatever, like what you said was correct as far as Randall, Randall specifically doesn't really fit with what they're trying to do offensively. So, like, they need to trade him regardless of if it's a contract year or not. He's just not – he doesn't fit with what they want to do. And so, uh, and I think he – so I guess the, the point of this is, is that he knows that, right? It's pretty clear the writing's on the wall. But do you feel like that's a thing that's, that's – you know, is it like by not speaking out against it, that means that the management is sort of uh, allowing that – is validating that rumor, I guess we'll call it? I guess I don't know. I mean, I, the, I, I wouldn't expect the Lakers management to, to speak out on that specifically. Right. I mean, that's the last thing they would I think they would they would do. Um, and you want to even if the player, even if it's all known inside that a guy doesn't have a great uh, much of a future with a team. I don't I, I, I hope that management would not say that publicly. And, and it, I don't think it would be good for them in terms of the guy's value. So yeah. they're not going to do that. Um, but just, I think, creating that situation and basically, I think, turning this into another sort of incubator year um, where they're, you know, expecting to lose or try to get Reno. I mean, and try to get rid of several players who are going to be on you know, some of the bigger contract players. If they, I mean, Lord knows how you move Luol Deng, uh, although his contract is getting towards the end. So maybe, um, you know, someone will want that to come off their books one day. Um, you know, how you even, you know, Brooke Lopez, who will have uh, who is he maybe opting out this year, but I don't know if he wants to. Um, there's anyway, they, they, the idea that they're going to move off a number of contracts and and this great strategy, this this great plan to then we're going to bring in the super team, you know, the rumors of LeBron and Paul George and if and, and whoever else they, you know, Carmelo Anthony, if he's not out there, uh, anyone else who may or may not come join the party um, that that big drum beat. Um, hey, and the funny thing about it all is if they pull it off, then all this is under the this is like water under the bridge. If that happens, um, then I don't think it makes them geniuses or anything, but they got what they wanted and you you have, you know, a, an immediate contender in in in, in the Lakers sure. and you won. And hopefully, hopefully Luke Walton weathers that storm uh, of this season and is given a chance to, to work with that team. But at the same time, I, I imagine if you're bringing in those kind of superstars, they may have ideas about who they want to coach them. And even if Luke is a great coach, uh, it may not be him. Right. I hear you. And by the way, like they, they've already did a really good job getting out of the Mozgov contract by getting rid of uh, Russell. And, you know, again, Russell, I guess we, we can't quite call him injury prone yet, but he certainly has really struggled to stay on the floor. Um, so as of, and by the way, and they get Kyle Kuzma out of that, which is like a, just a really nice way of getting rid of a terrible Mozgov contract, getting a great young player who is going to develop into, you know, he's already the leading scorer for the team as a rookie, which is, you know, I don't think, I don't remember when the last time that's happened. So, you know, that's good. And, and my point I also made on Twitter earlier was like every front office makes horrible mistakes. Like they all make this terrible decisions. They sign a bad contract, this and that, whatever. Uh, it's like, well, what do you do after that? So the Lakers have already begun the process of getting out of them, out of that. Uh, Dang actually has two more years. He signed through 1920. So uh, I don't think I, I think they're just going to eat it or or come to some early termination, uh, you know, thing where they can cut him and give him whatever that is. Uh, that's a problem. And, I, and again, that was a huge mistake. They never should have signed that contract because all it did was, again, delay Ingram because he took minutes last year from Ingram that he shouldn't have. Um, so, uh, but, you know, we'll have to wait and see how that goes with, with the Lakers. It's a really interesting uh, discussion. It's certainly how they progress. Uh, and again, it doesn't really matter because this year was never going to be a year they were going to really compete. They don't have the first round pick. Uh, this, I think this is the final, this is the year that Nash pick is going to convey, right? They yeah. they tanked long enough and now it's gonna have, they're gonna have to give it up. <laughs> um, but either way, we'll have to see. But I, I think that they're in the you know I just did a video on why they're the best front office and I tried to couch it. No one wanted to hear that because it was too nuanced. But on simply draft picks alone, they nailed seven picks in four years. Uh, you know, no other team has huh. done that in the last four years. And, and when I say nail, I mean a guy like Julius Randle. You might not like him, but. You can't argue that he's a serious – he can produce NBA stats. You know, he's a real producer, and you know. I, I, yeah, I think so. – it's, it's interesting the way it's, – it's, it's really interesting because – it's you I like I, I agree it's like I like each of those players and yet somehow none of them quite has emerged as 
being, you know, is hitting that level or even showing that they have a great chance of of hitting that level that we see they're capable of. And that that is often just a matter of time and situation. You know, with Randall, it's like, I agree, you know, he's shown that he can do a lot of things. And he looks like the kind of guy who may, if he ends up in a good situation in in the next spot, wherever it is, could suddenly emerge as, as, you know, as as a, a real impact maker if he's in the right role. You know, and it's funny because uh, he's really left-hand dominant and to the point where his whole body is sort of sh- is tilted and shifted that way. And it, you, you, I would argue, yeah, it's a real problem. Everyone's always complaining about it. But the dude's a double-double machine. And if you give him any kind of regular minutes, he will get you 15 points, 10 rebounds, and probably even like three assists. Th- those are terrific numbers uh, in, in that time. And, he, and so despite the issues he might have physically with that stuff, uh, yeah, he's a productive player. I, I think if anyone wants to know why I don't think he fits in with the Lakers do, the Lakers to me feel like they want to spread, they want to attack on the catch and get, you know, and really uh, have a lot of spacing. So he is not going to back up and shoot far enough for them from that position. And then he also just catches and he doesn't really attack on the catch. He has to jab step, he has to shot fake, and it kind of slows everything down and they do the five dribble isolations. And, uh, and that's why it doesn't work um, in the overall scheme. But you're right. They could find another team that doesn't have that same. I mean, it, they're, they're slowly going away, right, where most teams now are moving toward that kind of style. So he's going to be a dinosaur maybe sooner than later. But at the very least, there's still some teams, I suppose, out there that he could find some more, um, you know, some more uh, peace with and, and, and do his thing. So, you know. But, you know, let's, let's move on a little bit because I feel like, you know, the Lakers, we'll have to see. There's, there's enough questions there to, to sure. we need time. And I, I also want to talk because I'm a really big fan of Pacific Rims. Uh, I have to admit, someone bought it for me for my birthday, like, whenever, years and years and years ago. And it sat on a, on a shelf for a long time. Actually, it sat, uh, sat on the shelf next to Dean Oliver's uh, Basketball oh. Math or Math, whatever that his book is. Right. And I didn't want to, I'm like, ah, oh, who wants to read those things? And I read both of those probably like back to back and was so blown away, almost <laughs> angry that I waited so long to read them. Um, and so, but it actually was really enlightening what you wrote about uh, basketball and the NBA in particular uh, in the Philippines. And um, I've now discovered that because it turns out, you know, B-Ball Breakdown is actually pretty popular there. Uh, I, I don't, you don't have to tell me if you felt like that way. I don't think, when you, wait, when were you living in the Philippines? So I was living, I mean, I lived there full time from the late 2005 to the end of 2008. And I, but okay. I've been back every year since, uh, okay. except for one, and was living there again um, for six months between uh, uh, October of 2016 and, and uh, April of last year. Oh, wow. So I've, I mean, I've, I've, I've remained pretty much pretty close in touch. So I, I love it because like whenever I'll do a, um, a PBA games every once in a while and we'll do something like on Twitter and react and like the reaction's always been again it's a little delayed because they're sleeping when I'm doing it but uh, it's been really I, I, it's, it's it's overwhelming really uh, the passion uh, that they have I, I guess can we should, should we say puso that they have for, yeah uh, heart yeah for for b-ball for for the NBA so I I was wondering you know could just walk us through a little bit of that of the genesis of you arriving in the Philippines. And then I, I have to imagine that was, it was a surprise to you when you got there, how embedded basketball was in their culture. Well, so uh, yes and no, because I mean, th- this was, that was the specific thing that brought me to the country in the first place. Like coming out of college, I applied for a scholarship to go and research the, 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 the history and culture of, of basketball there. Um, so I knew there was something to it, but this was back in 2005 when the resources available to you on the Philippine basketball internet, I mean, basketball internet in general, but especially the, the, the PBA and, and the history of the game was not readily available for you to find. I remember when I, it was, I, I learned about the country's sort of love affair with basketball through Alex, Alexander Wolf, sports, the sports illustrator writer. He wrote a book called big game, small world. There was a chapter on the Philippines in there that really kind of blew my mind and you know sort of changed my whole life um uh and i went to do more research on it online and and really couldn't come up with much so some of the local newspapers would post game recaps but there was no you know sort of big picture thing explaining anything so on one hand i knew i, I was going there hoping to find this and thinking that it was there i had read some stuff to, to believe it was there but i was there's also a little part of me that was afraid that i would arrive in the country and be like, hey guys, where's the basketball? <laughs> and people would be like, well, you know, we got a gym over here. We like the sport, but it's nothing special. You know, it would be like just sort of any other country where, sure, there's a basketball community that's very passionate, um, and everyone else sort of goes about their own lives. 
But that is not the case. And I, <laughs> that is very much not the case. Basketball um, still is really in, deeply embedded in, in Philippine life. You know, whether or not people play the game. I mean, one, it, people play the game across the board um, in, in a way that you don't see the average American knows how to dribble, shoot, um, you know, and actually that is still people of uh, uh, one of the most popular pastimes throughout the country, urban or rural area. You know, once it gets cool enough in the afternoon, you get that like two hour window where it's not sweltering hot um, that everybody comes out and plays pickup, you know, and that's that's really that was really the, the you know, it was cool to watch the how how popular local leagues were and the NBA was out there and how knowledgeable basketball fans were in the Philippines. But what really, really sort of, you know, hit me right in the heart was seeing how much, how people played and really um, interacted with the game, uh, got their hands dirty in it every, every day. Um, that was amazing. And, and so um, it all just led to Pacific Rims. And, and I just, there's so many basketball stories out there, so many basketball fans and, and, and it's just part of people's lives every day in every way. Uh, that I, I could keep going back for the rest of my life and never run out of things to write about. Wow. So is, is, is that your goal? When, like, when you go back and you were there for six months now, like, that was your – are you just there to, to exist there because you love it so much? Or are you actually you know, actively looking or writing you know, more stuff on it? It depends. Um, sometimes, you know, I mean, I will if I will go back for just a couple of weeks to see friends and I have, like, godchildren and stuff out there. Um, but the, the, you know, the, the, what I, when I went back for the extended period of time last year, it was to, we were working on a, on a TV show for local cable. CNN Philippines did a, we did a 12 part series on basketball out there. So it was a lot of the same themes in, in Pacific Rims, but new characters, a few different wrinkles, um, and, and just getting it on tape on camera is a whole nother level because it's, I mean, I, I, as great as, you know, any, the greatest description in, in prose of, of, of some of these scenes just doesn't quite capture how amazing it is when you see these homemade basketball courts in the rural areas, you know, dirt court, when you, when you actually see the dust coming up from kids running, you know, in bare feet and shooting and plus being able to actually move, you know, I mean, you see guys, you know, being able to, to really, uh, you know, do a, like a, a tight in and out dribble crossover, a step mm -hmm. back and shoot mm -hmm. in bare feet on wow. a, on a homemade rim, uh, on some dirt and, and, you know, coming from, you know, the States where, uh, you know, we rarely, I, I, most basketball players here have probably never played, uh, in anything but sneakers. Um, right. That's amazing, you know, and you just like, how do you even do that? How do you even move that way? How do you even feel like your ankles are going to stay strong? Um, but it's funny out there, there in some of the more rural areas, you know, um, guys usually don't play in sneakers, but then there'll be a big tournament, the big annual tournament in the, in the, in the, in the area. And so then everyone puts on their sneakers and sometimes you'll see it like halftime guys getting frustrated. They're like, forget this, man. I don't, I, I'm not, these sneakers, <laughs> sneakers are messing me up. And they're like, wow, the sneakers to the sideline, put their flip flops back on and go out and, you know, go out and drop 20 in the second half. That is insane. Yeah, that is crazy. I, I, I've seen that before with even in the States, like, you know, screwing around, uh, you know, and, and guys doing that. I, and I'll never forget, like, seeing a guy playing in their in bare feet. But, uh, you know, the, the most striking image that I think of when I'm thinking of Filipino basketball and then the video stuff is when you'll see, like, it's a it's a normal court and it's a pickup game. or yeah, It's probably a pickup game. It's outside. And there's, like, 200 people on the in the backcourt watching the game. Yeah. And as soon as the ball comes back the other way, they scatter <laughs> And then the other people on the other side all fill in on the other backcourt. And then it's like a constant, like, I don't even know what, how do you describe it? Like, um, you know, ants swarming on a hill. Like, it's just crazy how back and forth they go and they, and they get out of the way. It's all because all they need to see the game. And, they, and it's, there's, too much, there's not enough room around the normal sidelines. Uh, they're using the, the backcourt. That's insane to me. And uh, just, I think, a really good <laughs> image as to how dedicated they are to the game. It's like the parting of the the basketball sees every time the ball has to come down and 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 have a possession on the other side. And actually, man, for the show we did last year, we went to that court in uh, Tondo, Manila. Like we we visited that specific court and talked to the people who were in that game about like what you know just how crazy it was, the atmosphere, and then you know what it was like a couple of days later when all of a sudden they went like viral for it, uh, and they're like, wow, everyone's looking at us. So yeah, that was what I mean. And it's sort of once or twice a year there's some amazing video now that comes out and sort of captures the the Philippines captures the the world's basketball internet 
um, uh, imagination of something from the Philippines, some crazy image that comes out of there, the kids playing in the floods, the it's always going to be something uh, really sort of powerful. And you're just like, wow, that's crazy. Well, the guys that actually make the PBA teams, which in the PBA is the equivalent of the NBA for you guys, um, those guys, when they're growing up, are they just like everybody else or are they picked early and they have sneakers and they're playing indoors from an early age? How does that work as they develop? Uh, it's both. Um, you know, there are uh, the, 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 you know, the, the most resources for basketball are concentrated in Manila, in the, in the capital. That's where they're, I mean, especially now, there are lots of really, really nice gyms. I think, you know, 10, 12 years ago, uh, the gyms were tended to be no air conditioning, uh, you know, dead spots, a little older, um, you know, a lot of that kind of old gym history that can be fun to play on, but maybe not if you're like an elite basketball player, you could use something better. Um, uh, and, and now they they really have great facilities all over Manila. Um, it's It's really been incredible to see but anyway so so the there are people who grow up in manila and now you see and this is happening in the nba as well you know a lot of the 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 best prospects are the children of former players former stars um or just former sort of rotation players in the in the in the pba um you know because because of the genes because of the knowledge of what it takes to get there because you know they have a little more resources because their father was a was a professional basketball player so you see the, the 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 talent that comes from Manila, and if you're talented in Manila and you get put on one of the uh, the, the 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 good high school teams, there no there's no NCAA amateurism stuff in, to to worry about in that country. Like the you can play in college. I mean the be, the the best high school players have endorsement deals with Nike or Adidas, and more likely Nike in high school. Like by the time they're 15 or 16. Wow. Um, so and they carry those through college and they and also they they, they I, I, this is not necessarily, um, you know, official, but they are they receive, uh, you know, they receive allowances and stuff to play for colleges. Um, you see, you know, families are given places to live and jobs uh, within colleges, you know, not just as like assistant coaches like we see here in the States, but like. And, you know, in so so one of the you know the colleges are sort of the the, the basketball teams are bankrolled by wealthy patrons um, and who, who are alumni in most in most cases. And then they will you know they will sort of give you know, you're you're a great player you know we'll give your dad a job in my in my you know in my telephone business or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so there th that whole system exists to keep uh, the keep players in Manila and keep them there from an early age, but they can't always predict where talent is going to come from. And right. you, so you do see talent coming from the provinces, from the South, from the North, from these guys who really, until they reached college, probably mostly did only play in flip flops or occasion, you know, in big tournaments, they would, they would, they would throw on sneakers, but really did grow up in that grassroots style. Um, and it, it ends up being almost equally matched, about 50-50. Um, and it's cool because you see, you know, sometimes you, you still see guys who grew up and did, weren't necessarily getting into basketball camps and, and great coaching and, and, uh, and that kind of level of instruction at an early age. Uh, and they pick it up later on, but they still have that instinctual style of play. They, they, they throw up some shots that look crazy, things you would never see in, in, in a lot of organized basketball, but they're practiced and effective at it, and it still works, these, these, these kind of moves. So it's, it's really, it can be really kind of a, a great mix of, of ad hoc, you know, self-taught basketball uh, with the, 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 you know, pretty modern approach to the game that, that uh, coaches in Manila are learning from American coaches and European coaches and their own, you know, generational knowledge because the, the sport has been in the country for, you know, for, you know, hundreds of years. Absolutely. And, and, and the symbiosis is now culminating with Tim Cohn running a triangle offense and winning championships with a, a mixture of these different kind of players and styles. And I can't I have to get over there. I've, I've been trying to figure out how to get over there for a while now and cover some stuff because I want to see this because I have a feeling as I'm always looking for, you know, the fundamentals and what's the fake fundamentals, what are real fundamentals. I want to start looking at what you're talking about there, what the shots are doing, because you know what? There might be things that I'm like that are that, that's actually a, a, a better way to do that shot. Like if it's a, a 180 when the guy's in your back, I don't know what, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. I'm, I'm assuming when I'm picturing it in your descriptions were those kind of shots where you're just sort of like, you know, like maybe it's even like the Blake Griffin stuff that drives me crazy. Probably maybe that is the best way to do it when you realize what they're doing and how if you can refine the training. So anyway. 
Uh, I have to get over there. I, 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 I can't get enough of when I'm reading about what you're... I, I always pick up Pacific Rims and, and read more of it again and just kind of refresh my memory of what's going on and what your experiences were there. So I can't suggest enough uh, from the listeners that they should go get the book and read it. Um, and just really quickly, you have a new book that came out last year, Two and Two. Uh, it's about growing up in a, in a bar in McSorley's, which is a famous bar in New York, right? Yeah, so my father is a career bartender at uh, McSorley's Old Ale House, which is one of the oldest bars in New York. It's basically, the, our claim on being the oldest is it's the oldest continuously operating bar. Okay. So it's been open in the same spot on East 7th Street since uh, 1854. Um, and my father's been working there since 1972. Um, I, he, he, you know, he brought me there all the time as a kid. I grew up you know, in the bar, basically. Um, and so it's the, the book is about, you know, his career, the modern history of the bar, uh, what it was like to grow up there. And eventually I used to work there myself. So, you know, a sort of a behind the scenes look at what it was, what it's like to, to, to be in there these days. Um, and just sort of a, yeah, a, a New York story. Uh, I love it. And it kind of just reminds me of like the, the, the 50s and 60s sports writers who had the trench coats and the hat and they would probably go right sit at the bar and have a beer and they'd talk amongst themselves and cover the games. Uh, and I'm fascinated by that era as well. I know that, um, oh my God, who just died in Sports Illustrated? Uh, Frank DeFord had a book mm -hmm. which you may have read. And he talks all about that era. He just started in that era in that madman style. I just, I'm fascinated by that whole notion of what like the sports writing was back then. And especially like in that kind of setting. So, uh, I'm not, I'm going to pick that up too and have to read it ASAP. And, uh, Rafe, I can't thank you enough for coming on. This is really great. I thought we, there's some really great stuff. I thought, you know, we even talked about it's the LeVar thing and the media. It's a really fascinating conversation that I don't think people are, you know, get too in depth with a lot. I, I hope so. I hope so. Uh, and thanks, Nick. I mean, it, it's cool to, to do it and hopefully do it again and, and see you out here in L.A. For sure. You know what? Next time you'll have to come in the studio and we'll do it that way. And we'll, maybe we'll even do a live. Uh, you know, we can broadcast that to Periscope and, uh, and have fun with it. So, uh, again, thank you for, so much for coming in. I really appreciate it. And uh, don't forget, sports fans, at B-Ball Breakdown, not a channel. We're a conversation. Are you in? Are you in, Rafe? I'm in.